Welcome to Mimiki TV. I'm your host, Mimiki Kuni. I'm honored to be with you on this journey towards empowering you to succeed in faith, leadership, and business. So you have to be willing to receive, you have to be willing to put yourself first for once in the middle of a hard place. And when we allow others to help us, we're kind of fulfilling that full picture of if there's no one to love, then how can they fulfill the commandment to love their neighbor, right? Because if I'm rejecting that, I'm basically saying, you can't be God's hands and feet today because I won't let you help me. Welcome to Mimika TV. I'm your host, Mimika Kuni. Today, we're talking about discovering hope in the hard places. Sarah Beckman helps women find hope so they can love themselves and others well, no matter how difficult their situation. Sarah is a national speaker, best-selling author, and seasoned media guest, having appeared on programs like The 700 Club, The Difference, and 100 Huntley Street. After enduring a childhood of brokenness and a decade of hardship as an adult, she's discovered the importance of learning to love better and tools for getting through our own hard places. She has a passion for walking alongside people who are suicidal, addicted, divorced, or abused, and is intimately involved with their situations, loving them through it. So I'm going to say welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much for being on my uh, podcast today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Well, I've got some great things that I want to ask you because you've got a great topic we're talking about today. And you are the author of your new book, which is what Hope in the Hard Places. So congrats on that. I know how how hard work, how much hard work goes into writing a book. I always say it's like having a baby. It's, yes. it's totally emotional. Um, and you've got some great, great tips you're going to give us, and, and especially with helping people under, to, to really discover that hope. But before we get into the meaty bits, tell our audience how you got started and a little bit of your backstory. Yes, well, you touched a little on it in the bio, but I grew up the youngest of 14 children. And 14? Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so like that's hard enough, right? No. Exactly. Like, whoa, stop right there, girl. Let's see. How was that for you? <laughs> Interview over. No. Um, so, anyway, that was how I sort of began my journey as a young girl. My dad, unfortunately, was alcoholic, and then my parents were divorced when I was five. So as a young girl, I definitely knew what it was like to receive because our family didn't have much and the community sort of walked through those really hard times with us. And then I had sort of my wayward teen years and learning, you know, finding my way to faith. And as a young mom, then I was on bed rest with my third child. And then in six years, I had to have four back surgeries. And so I was on the receiving end of a lot of help. And in that, I also then walked with friends who were terminal and, and, and not just friends, but family. And I learned a lot about sort of what I knew from receiving that I knew to do better with them. And that led me to my first book, which is called Alongside. And that is written for the friend or loved one that wants to do this better, to love someone and be there for them in the hard places. But then I realized that I was missing that other half of the equation, right? That there are the people in the hard place that wanted the same things, encouragement, hope, practical tips. How do I navigate this? And that's where Hope in the Hard Places was born. Oh, well, there you go. So it's kind of like starting a project and then seeing it from different angles, which is great because there's the, you can never talk too much about a certain topic like hope, right? And there's right. Always, somebody's always in that situation who's looking for that. So knowing that you've gone through this and you've walked through these places, and a lot of us, a lot of our listeners are either in the middle of it or are, are either trying to get through it or have just begun a, a really hard, challenging moment. So if we had to break it down and give them some tips, what did you find was actually the most useful in order for you to actually go through these without lo losing your hope and your faith? I think one of the most important things that we neglect is that we forget about setting out on the journey with the right mindset. Uh, and so it's so interesting because if we're doing anything in our life that's not in the middle of a crisis, right, we would make a plan probably and we would know where we're going. And like for your, if you're going on a trip, you would have all the things laid out. But the minute you hit a hard place or a crisis, it's different. We forget to kind of pause and set the journey the way we need to. So I believe really the first thing that people can do is get their mindset right. Like, I want to go through this. I know I'm going to have to be flexible, or I know things are going to be hard, or um, how can I set my frame? I'm going to trust God in all things. You know, knowing that we want to set the stage before we start is sort of a 
thing that doesn't come naturally to us when we're in the crisis. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's hot, the fire, the house is burning, what do we do? Freak out, freak out. And we kind of lose all our sort of logic thinking, not, not necessarily logic, because when it, comes, when it comes to God, our faith walk is pretty much relationship-based, right? Yes. Um, so it's kind of like what you say, and I love you mentioned my one of my favorite words, which is mindset. Because if we don't think right, we are, you know, we're focusing on the negative, we can really, you know, you start to see this this molehill grow into a mountain. So like take us, walk us through one of those instances. I mean, like you were you said you were you had some um, your own surgeries and that physical pain when somebody's in chronic pain. I mean, that's a really tough one because it's pretty much overrides a normal life. Like, how did you find cope in that hard place? <laughs> right. Well, one of the time, many of the times that I had back surgery and was just laid up in my bed, the mindset became then what I chose was a focal point. And if you know, like when you're giving birth in the hospital, they used to tell you to put a focal point in the room. So you had something to focus on. And so I kind of accidentally fell into this because I had bought a piece of scripture that was like a needlepoint stitch that said, be still and know I'm God. And I, when I was on bed rest, it was sitting on the floor in the corner, never hung on the wall, right? But I knew it was there and I kept looking at it. So then finally, when bed rest was over, I hung that thing on the wall. And then sure enough, I'm stuck in my bed four more times and I had to, and it was hung. And that really, I literally looked at it countless times during the day to just remember that in the time of being still in the time that's not comfortable for me because I like to go 100 miles an hour and I'm a doer and a projects and organized and let's get this done not lie in my bed you know hours on end day after day after day you know so that focal point and the mindset of I'm trusting God in this he's going to use this time for me going to use my be still time to teach me to mold me to shape me and it's all it can be for my good if I allow it to be and so I tried to look at the like for one of the times when I was on bed rest for instance too I could only shower every other day and because I had to stand up so I would take baths and my mindset was okay pretty soon I'm gonna have three children and I'm not going to be able to take a bath. So whenever I take a bath, instead of being grumpy, I'm going to be really happy that I'm sitting in the tub resting. So little things like that. It's kind of like flip the script, right? Instead of reading from a negative review, you can kind of like decide to focus on something. It's kind of like, um, I think they call it the reticular access system. Uh, I could be stand corrected, but it's literally like you, you never notice a Ferrari down the road. And then all of a sudden you see one and then you see all of them that you think, well, this place is full of Ferraris, but they, they probably were there, but you just never noticed them before. So right. I think that's, that's a really good tip, especially when we're focusing on that hard place to kind of redirect. Now, one thing I always think this is, um, this is so true with the Lord is, um, I don't believe the Lord ever gives us suffering, but he certainly uses it. Now, yes. what would you say to the person? Because I know personally myself, I resisted kind of going through the process because we feel like this is too painful. This is too hard. Like, I don't want to do this. Um, isn't there a way around it? How do you embrace just saying, okay, I'm going to be in the moment and just allow you to actually get through it? Like, for instance, grief. Like, grief is one of those things that it just has a cycle. No matter what we do, we can't force it, right? Is it just something that you you find like as you're going through this process that something you learned from that? Yeah, one of the things I learned is just that we have to be above the circumstance in the sense that recognizing that God is still good, even if our circumstance is not. And for me, I could never navigate any of the hard places without my faith in God, because it's his touch where I could see his hand working through a friend that showed up at the door with a coffee or someone who I hardly knew volunteering to watch my children. Or um, we were taking a parenting class 19 weeks long when I went on bed rest and the whole parenting class came to my house to take the class because I couldn't get up and leave the house. And then one of the gals said, I'm going to bring dinner every Sunday night to class so that your family has dinner every Monday night. I mean, I hardly knew her. And so when we see the hand of God in human beings that offer support and give us that love and care and concern, it just, it does, it helps us get through it and see that we might feel like we're being refined and it's painful. Um, and even, you know, in grief, you know, I really have experienced a lot of grief as well. And 
the people, one day, one girl showed up at my door, literally standing there with a beautiful hydrangea plant and a card for me. And it was so unexpected because it was my friend that passed. And so we were all focused on the children and the husband and the sister and the parents. And this woman saw that I was grieving too, as the best friend. And I just remember standing outside crying in the driveway, like holding this plant, thinking like, yes, God sees me because he sent a friend to see me in my pain. I think that's what's so amazing about, you know, the body of Christ is that when we do come together and we are a community, we do carry each other's loads. And I think that's what we're missing, wouldn't you say, from today's society. We're so connected on digital devices, but yet I hear this often is that we feel so isolated and alone, this lack of community. Yes. And that was really one of the things that I touched a lot, actually, on the first book is that we are called by God to love our neighbor as ourself, right? And so then what does that look like? We have to be willing to like ring a doorbell or stretch out of our comfort zone or bring a meal or text someone and say, I'm at Target. What can I pick up for you? And so we have to be willing to stretch ourselves in order to offer that hand to someone else and be there as like of testimony. But then when you flip it to hope in the hard places, if I'm someone who needs help and yet I might reject the help that someone's trying to offer me, which is something I really think we struggle with, right? Receiving help is a very difficult thing. And I have been there. So I, I am speaking from experience. Yeah, me too. It's us women, especially, right? Especially when you're a mother, you're so used to just putting the, the needs of the husband and the family and the kids that you're like, oh, well, I'll get to that nap later. Oh, I'll get to that getting my hair done later. And you, wouldn't you say that's kind of like a, it's an important part of the whole process. Yes, you have to be willing to receive. You have to be willing to put yourself first for once in the middle of a hard place. And when we allow others to help us, we're kind of fulfilling that full picture of if there's no one to love, then how can they fulfill the commandment to love their neighbor, right? Because if I'm rejecting that, I'm basically saying you can't be God's hands and feet today because I won't let you help me. So that's just such an interesting way to view it. And as to your point of carrying each other's burdens, I love that verse in Galatians that says, carry one another's burdens. So in order for you to fulfill that call of Christ to carry burdens of other people, I have to let you help carry mine. And that is, I mean, it's just a twofold, very important to see both sides of the equation. Exactly, because the person giving the help also gets a blessing from it. Like they get their blessing and then you are receiving a blessing too. And I think at the end of the day, something like that not being able to receive, because I'm guilty of that too, where we just find it's hard. It's almost like, I don't know if it's pride or if it's almost like embarrassment. We don't want people to know that we're weak because everyone needs to show this, this, this fabulous face on Facebook or whatever else is that, like we've got it all together. Well, no, ask your girlfriend, we ain't got it together. The, the truth is we're all a hot mess and we need each other. <laughs> yeah, truth, preach. <laughs> yeah. So what would you say like in terms of um, moving forward, like any actual tips, like what sort of tips could you give them that you find like when you're in that set? Because we've mentioned mindset and we mentioned community, but what other things would you say were kind of pivotal in getting you to move forward? Yeah. And we talked about a focal point, which I think is huge. Like set your focal point, whether it's a Bible verse or a scriptural truth or any mantra that you would repeat. I mean, I have friends that have um, one family I know was going through cancer. Um, Another family member had a stroke. Someone else was getting divorced. They were going through all that within like six months of time. And they picked the word joy and they picked that as their focal point and they put it on backpacks and coffee mugs and wall hangings and pillows and everywhere they looked, they put the word joy so they could remind themselves to be joyful. Uh, Another thing that we don't think about very often is choosing our team. Who are we going to have with us? This community notion, but being really intentional. Who do I want alongside me? Are there people that can um, take on a very specific role, like someone who could do um, communications to get keep everyone in the loop so that I don't have to worry about how does everyone know how the treatments are going or how what I need or if we're doing meals or whatever like just assigning someone to do that or assigning someone to be in charge of helping you coordinate child care if you have children or rides or you know how are we going to do all of it and depending on how hard your place is sometimes you just have no capacity to do those things And so like to even have the brain power to set it up, 
And so choosing people to take specific roles for you is really important. And then another, um, the third one I would suggest is that we have to determine sort of our non-negotiables. And that would be what are routines that we absolutely are not willing to let go of. You know, I exercise, I need to walk. So I will walk three times a week regardless. And it's going to be at this time, no matter how many other people need me or what appointments I have, or, you know, like just knowing this is a thing or rules for your kids. You know, it gets really hard if mom or dad are the one that are affected with the hard place. And then the kids are kind of waffling and they're going to a friend's house and they're eating all the things they normally don't eat. And, you know, you just have to decide like, what is my non-negotiable in this situation? I'm not allowing my kids to have sweets every single day, 75 times a day, because they're crazy when they do that, right? Or whatever it is. So determining non-negotiables and just sticking to them, like I'm going to drink my water. I'm going to eat this way. I'm going to never miss my yoga class. I mean, you could name whatever you want, but Sometimes we don't think about it. And again, we get deep in the mire and all of a sudden we are panicking. We're, we're sinking in the quicksand and we hadn't really planned that we're, it, we're in a hard place. We got to take some measures here. So I love it. It's kind of like taking baby steps, that whole list of approach. It's a thing called Kaizen, like the, the, the wins, the little wins actually help us progress because if you kind of take on, it's like saying, I want to lose a hundred pounds in a month, right? That's totally right. ridiculous. Like you, you're kind yeah. of reaching for something you can never achieve, but saying, you know, I want to go for one walk three times, you said three times a day, that's achievable. And I think what's great is even though we don't feel like necessarily doing something by taking those small little consistent steps, eventually the feelings catch up with the decision and then it becomes habit, right? So kind of yes. forcing this new way of thinking, which is really related to what God says about renewing the mind. Right, right, exactly. Just trying to keep our eyes fixed on him, the author and perfecter. And we, we can keep our eyes on him better when we're taking care of ourselves, even though it's a crisis and things are hard and we just have to take a step back and like, I'm going to go to my Bible study every week. I'm going to keep reading my scripture every day, whatever it is that we do, we have to decide we're going to keep, we're not going to let every single thing in our life go, go wild. We're going to try and keep some structure as much as possible. And it's pretty much what I love what you said is, um, not letting our circumstances really dictate our day or our happiness or our, our or where we're going to go. Cause it's very, you know, very disconcerting when you get tossed by the wind, right? When you get one thing, you're doing one thing one day and another thing another day. And yeah, I mean, creating new habits is hard, but it's really making that decision and then making, having the mindset that I'm going to make this work and I'm, I'm going to until the rest of it catches up. So I think that's some really great, um, some content so just give us a little bit more about what's actually in the book like how do you walk through people through this is this something that you find that anything else that you would add to how you would actually find the hope because we know we've talked about the mindset and was there anything else that you find was really pivotal in and also writing the book because the reasons for writing it yes well um like i said originally i wrote it because i kept hearing from people that were saying when they looked at alongside well i'm the one in the hard place so this book is for my family and friends but what about me and and just beside the fact traveling around and speaking to women's groups that all over the country i i hear the pain i hear the hard stories and i am a practical girl that's just kind of who i am by nature i want steps and tools and tips and like, how are we going to navigate this? Let's make a plan. And so a lot of hope in the hard places is very practical, but it's broken into different parts. And the first part is sort of like the terrain. And we talk about how sometimes we're entrusted with the trial. And what does that look like to actually think about it as something that God wants us to multiply? Like the parable of the talents talks about. Um, we cover the why me and that chapter is called detour. And it can be, if we sit and get mired in the why, why me, why my child, why my friend, why my mom, whatever it is, we can just be stuck and we will, we will find no hope if we are sitting in that place of why. Like the pity party, right? Because they say, I have a saying on Instagram, a pity party is a party of one because no one else wants to come to your pity party. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Absolutely. So the beginning is sort of we lay out the terrain and then we kind of go into preparation. And that I would say is like we talk about um, first aid and, and building your team and what kind of gear you're going to bring. And that's like mindset, focal point. Um, the right people, assigning roles to people. So it's very practical in nature. The beginning is more like big picture. 
And then we get into that sort of notion of um, the journey. And all those chapters are actual practical things we can do. Um, we ask for directions, which is about asking for help. We quench our thirst, which is actually receiving the help when it comes our way. We look for the green, which means like focusing on how we can be grateful today. Um, we talk about seeking the source and different ways to connect to God in the middle of your hard place. Um, so there's like lots more. And one of them that one of my favorite chapters is called removing the boulders. And we talk about the boulders of unmet expectations and the boulders of unacknowledged denial and unwarranted fear. Um, so there, it, it's just an interesting notion that if we go on a boulder, we can look out and have a great vantage point, or we could be crushed under a boulder if we're hiking and it falls down on us. So knowing that the boulders are there and that we have to acknowledge them and that they won't crush us. Um, so yeah, that's just, it's as practical as I can be, but it's full of faith and a lot of truth and scripture to preach, you know, to yourself and over yourself. And yeah. Well, I find it very encouraging. And I mean, I'm, I'm a book, book lover too. I'm constantly reading. I actually read, listen to books quicker on audio than I can actually read them, which right. is great because you, you want those, those practical tips. So, um, so before we finish on the topic of the book, tell everybody where is the best place to find info about you and everything that you're doing online? Yeah. So, um, my website is Sarah with an H and Beckman, B E C K M A N dot org, O R G. And there is a tab for both books there. And each of them have, like, you know, alongside and hope in the hard places. And there's links and info and videos and trailers and all the things that if anyone wants more information, they can get it all at my website. Yeah. So, yeah. So, well, before we wrap up today, would you mind praying with our audience just to pray everybody, everybody who's listening today? Oh, I would be honored to do that. Um, am I, are you an eyes open prayer, eyes closed prayer? <laughs> well, it just depends on, you know, well, if for those who are listening, that they're not going to really know whether, if they want to pray with their eyes open and they're on the treadmill, then go ahead. <laughs> yes, yes. Please keep your eyes open if you're in the car or driving or anywhere <laughs> that you need to be. The prayer is over you. Um, Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for any ear that is listening, any eye that is watching today, um, this podcast. And I just ask you, Lord, that you would meet each person in the middle of whatever they're going through, that you would remind them that you love them, that you see them, that you are for them, that they are chosen, holy, loved, and that even in the middle of the pain, you are there. Lord, I pray that you would send holy warring angels to surround these friends. I pray that they would be able to wear the uh, armor of God, the buckle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that they would see their hardship, their trial, whatever they might be coming out of, going into, um, or in the middle of. I pray that they would see it as an opportunity for you to speak, to show your power in the weakness. And I just thank you for who you are, always constant, sovereign, loving. And, and really the lover of our soul and the lifter of our head. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for that. I love these prayers because I know it means we, for those lis listening and watching, we are standing in agreement with you because sometimes, as you said, we, it can feel really alone when you're in the middle of this. Yes. And, you, and, and sometimes we don't, we don't feel like we're brave enough to reach out. So even if we don't know you, we've never met you, we definitely know we, you have, we have you in our prayers and um, definitely that's something. Get in touch. Make sure you get in touch with Sarah and find her books. There are some awesome resources, resources. But if you've enjoyed what we had to say today, make sure to share it with your friends. I'm sure you know a friend who needs to hear what Sarah shared today because she's got some great actionable tips that can actually help you right now. And if you have any aha moments, any sort of, sort of takeaway tips of what you're going to do, make sure to go to the bottom of the video and let us know in your, your comments. We love to keep the conversation going. And just to see, you know, how are you finding that in anything that's, really resonating with you being the Holy Spirit's showing you something you know we would really would love to stand and, and um, support you on that and if you want more freebie resources that I only share with my newsletter community go to mamikacuni.com and I have an awesome gift bundle that includes my book mindset makeover how to renew your mind and walk in God's authority and some other digital goodies which are like my screensavers like on my phone like how many times do you think you've touched your phone a day right Sarah 
Right, a lot. <laughs> a lot, right? So every time you want to touch your phone, you want to make sure that you remind yourself, like these are little scripture references you can speak out loud. You know, awesome. again, we talked about making better habits. So I think this is a great way. Things don't have to be huge. They just be small little baby steps, which could be just recite this one little line of scripture and start keep doing that as a matter of habit and you will be well on your way. Yeah. But I say thank you so much for sharing your wonderful story and your insights um, and your encouragement. I know my audience are already going to love this content, but again, make sure to reach out to Sarah. Are you on um, Instagram or Facebook or any online platforms? Yes. Yes. Facebook is Sarah Beckman and Instagram is Sarah Beckman author. Oh, awesome one. And also we will have the show notes with all the links available too. But I'm going to say thank you again, Sarah, for joining us and everyone listening. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Till next time, take care. Are you ready to build a platform with a purpose? Come to mamikakuni.com and download your free checklist, How to Build Your Platform in 30 Days.